This is a 25-year-old female complaining of severe dyspnea. So this woman has a history of asthma. She has a history of smoking. She is a smoker. And I always counsel my smokers who say they have asthma. Well, one, they probably more likely have COPD if they've developed their asthma, quote-unquote, later in life. But if they were an asthmatic from a young age and they're a smoker, they're playing Russian roulette. So I always counsel them on smoking cessation. I think that's very reasonable. The more people that they hear it from, um, you know, that, that provide some empathy and show that they care, uh, at some point in time, uh, they're going to get motivated to to, uh, to to make an effort to quit. Um, sudden dyspnea without chest pain, so no chest pain. No fever, cough, sputum, and already mentioned no chest pain. This was a sudden onset. The patient has had similar episodes to this, um, <clears throat> and she's really severely uh, dysmic. Uh, from an exam standpoint, when you see her, she is tripoding. She is diaphoretic. She's morbidly obese. Now that is is important because the 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 more the, the higher the body mass index that abdominal fat decreases the excursion of the diaphragm so there's even less reserves so if you take someone who has a body mass index that's you know roughly normal let's say perhaps you know 20 or so and you compare that to someone who's got a body mass index of who is in the obese range 30 35 morbidly obese above that um, the, their their inside body morphology hasn't changed. It's the, the 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 fat layering. Their diaphragm doesn't have the excursion, so that means that this person who has severe dyspnea is not going to have the reserve to, to to move air through their system, move air through their lungs to keep up their minute volume. So that's an important thing. She's got accessory muscle use. And I'm abbreviating there. Barely audible lung sounds. So we can barely hear. And this isn't because the patient's obese. This is because she is not moving air. Uh, one word, dyspnea. So she can only say one word at a time between breaths. She has one word, dyspnea. This is a, someone who's in severe respiratory distress. Uh, she's tachycardic. There's normal pulse strength. She's alert and oriented right now. BP is 150 over 98. She's a little hypertensive. Her pulse is 140. Uh, it's regular, so she's not in an AFib. She's breathing at 36 to 40, and it is labored. Very labored. Sat. If there's anything that's positive about this presentation, she's 96% on an honor breather. If that doesn't concern you, it should. Because it's taking one, it's taking the honor breather to maintain a, a, an adequate set. The other thing is she's breathing at 36 to 40 a minute to get enough minute volume of air moving through her lungs to maintain that oxygen saturation. That is someone who's in severe respiratory distress. Her temperature was 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, so she's not febrile. So what other assessments are, are indicated in this patient? So one thing that may be helpful is capnography. And the reason for that capnography may be helpful is it may help differentiate. The patient has a history of asthma, but even though she's young, she's... Um, hypertensive. I'm just going to switch colors here for a minute. You know, she's hypertensive. Could she have CHF? You know, she may have a cardiomyopathy or an, or an enlargement of 
uh, the, the uh, left ventricle of the heart, so it may not be squeezing as well. She may have a, an underlying history or a predisposition for heart failure. So, um, capnography may be helpful in differentiating between is this respiratory distress caused by asthma or caused by um, you know, or bronchospasm or caused by CHF. So in, in asthma, and let's say we put the patient on, on uh, side stream nasal, can nasal cannula capnography, so we get in this particular patient, we notice that we have this sawtooth wave and it drops as she takes a breath and it's going a lot faster than what I'm depicting here just because she's tachypnic, but this sawtooth wave, which is different than our normal inspiration, expiration, inspiration, expiration, this sawtooth wave that we see here is indicative of bronchospasm where it's difficult. Remember capnography, the, the wave is the reverse of what you think. This is actually the exhalation phase. So she's having a tough time exhaling her air. So that's a marker for bronchospasm. Where someone who's got CHF, they're going to have a fairly normal excursion because this is not an issue with the uh, bronchial size. This is an issue with uh, a barrier to oxygenation, uh, some barrier for ventilation. So if anything, you might have a de decreased plateau, but you're not going to have a change in the waveform. So capnography is um, one assessment tool that um, may be useful. 12 lead, because again, you know, this woman's predisposed to, to, to um, cardiac events. The other thing, and this is a little bit beyond the, talk, the scope of this talk, um, but we'll, we'll produce another one that talks about this. But point of care ultrasound, using the ultrasound machine to look at the lungs and differentiate between CHF by looking at fluid versus pneumonia. Uh, you know, versus other pathology. For example, pneumothorax, PTX is the thing for pneumothorax. So those are some those are some some objective evidence that we may need uh, that would be helpful. So what's our differential? Um, I think probably fairly obviously, um, asthma. Um, actually, I'm going to change the acute to. I'm going to change that to status. Asthmaticus. I wish I could give you a picture of this patient, but this is someone who's very, very sick. So status asthmaticus. Um, we can't hear lung sounds very well. Could she have a pneumothorax? I guess it's possible. Could she have a pneumonia? Well, she doesn't have fe she doesn't have fever. Uh, this is a fairly sudden onset. There's usually a little bit of a, a little bit of a prodrome. It may only be a couple of hours, but there's usually a prodrome with uh, with pneumonia. So probably not as likely. PE is that may be a concern also. This is someone who's obese, who's sedentary, doesn't move around a lot. Um, you know, PE might be a reasonable reasonable on differential. This this occurred pretty quickly. So. What are the treatment priorities? We need to increase ventilation. We're oxygenating okay. We, we have the oxygen with an IRE either, but we need to increase ventilation. And the way we do that is we need to, to uh, bronchodilate. So I apologize for using trade names, but I'm going to put in duonab or albuterol or petropium. Um, and this patient is likely going to need multiple treatments. Um, it is safe to give multiple treatments in the same chamber. There's some good emergency medicine literature uh, supporting that. Uh, if that's something that's allowed within the the, uh, the treatment guidelines, uh, great. If not, talk to your medical director. Um, but I'll I'll usually start off hitting uh, these patients pretty hard with uh, with the uh, bronchodilators, steroids. 
Now, oral steroids and IV steroids both have almost the same time of onset. IV is just a little bit faster, uh, but this patient's not going to swallow a pill, so we're going to give her some IV uh, steroids, solumedrol. Um, this is someone who's in acute respiratory distress and asthma, so I may consider magnesium. I may also consider epinephrine as well. Um, I am because sub Q, she's not perfusing very well. We need to uh, we need to keep, to get that in, and there's a little bit better perfusion in the muscles. So definitely ep uh, epinephrine if we're going to go that route, which may be very reasonable to do with this patient because she's in severe distress. You know, we want to try to catch her before she intubate. You know, get, needs to be intubated. Um, uh, we may consider epinephrine uh, IM. Alternatively, some places are still carrying tributylene. This tends to not raise the heart rate and blood pressure as much as epinephrine does, uh, but it's still somewhat effective in, in bronchodilating. So that's, uh, that's a, a, a possibility there. We may need to get her on some pressure support so CPAP, BiPAP, whatever you know whichever you have uh, in uh, your bus um, and then finally we may need to intubate this patient uh, if you're a service that does do uh, rapid sequence intubation or medication facilitated intubation um, then ketamine is the drug of choice in patients who have severe bronchospasm uh, because one of the side effects of ketamine is, is some bronchodilation so it you know helps with that um, <clears throat> so that that's that that's uh, kind of the run of the, the pre-hospital treatment um, I'm, I'm going to add heliox uh, mixture of helium and oxygen uh, which the gas weighs less the mo helium molecules are smaller so it helps deliver more oxygen to the uh, tissues other, you know, which is different than the um, 100% oxygen or the nitrogen oxygen mix that is in room air. Uh, some services are carrying Heliox, um, so that we've we've kind of hit a, a pretty good rundown here. Uh, in terms of our reevaluation, we're looking at vitals, but most importantly, we're looking at work of breathing. This is where the, the rubber meets the road. Uh, this is where we're going to see asking the patient that they feel better, asking her or observing her, her chest to make sure that her chest uh, rise is improved, that her respiratory rate is slowing, that her pulse rate is slowing. A lot of people get concerned. She's got a pulse of 140. A lot of people get concerned with administering NIB treatments, uh, epinephrine, tributylene, any of those uh, kind of sympathomimetic medications to someone who's tachycardic and yes I understand that but they're probably tachycardic because they're trying to circulate oxygen they're not getting enough in because of the bronchospasm a lot of times these patients if we can get them on the on the treatments get their passages opened up uh, their heart rate will come down and those are some pretty significant markers uh, we can follow the uh, end tile co2 uh, to see if that waveform changes uh, so we've got a few different ways of, um, of reassessing the patient. Um, and then disposition, we're going to need to get to the nearest uh, facility. There are still a lot of EMS systems that are not doing medication facilitated intubation. And this patient is still conscious, still alert. Uh, they may end up needing to be intubated. Um, so we, we need to get them to the nearest facility to be able to do that, whether it's a freestanding ER or a, or a, a full service hospital.